my gosh, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. I am so excited about this broadcast. Uh, well, you're going to probably guess it already just from the image, the two witnesses. But this is the two witnesses on steroids. This is a message that is out of this world. And I really want to thank the Heavenly, our Heavenly Father for revealing these things to me, showing me scriptures and passages that I never even knew existed that pertain to what is about to happen. Putting together even where we were just recently speaking over at Malachi 4. Uh, in fact, I better make sure I have that up in the King James Version so we don't confuse people. Uh, I, I apologize too. I, I'm having a lot of stomach issues right now. Uh, uh, won't go into all of that, but just some problems that, I, that I'm dealing with. So just pray for me about that. Appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, in fact, I think we're going to pray before we even get started on this. It's just that's how serious I feel like that this message is this evening. Um, you know, so I do want to I want to go into a lot of information with you. And uh, I know it's going to be a blessing for many of you. I'm going to put comments on controlled so I can get your feedback uh, on these things. Also to definitely check out Patreon. Uh, I just loaded a new video on there. That one I'm actually going into the Nephilim. Uh, and how did they get here after the flood? The proof, scripturally, the proof of that. And I've talked about that before here on Israeli News Live uh, and on Danun Institute of Biblical Research. So you can always go there and watch it there as well. But on this time on Patreon, I did want a little bit more special because uh, having a conversation with a doctor friend of mine last night, uh, we got into the subject of that and it really inspired me and I had some new little points there I was able to bring out and share that. So definitely check that out. Uh, and it's a good way to support the ministry is our Patreon channel. And, uh, and, and while I'm at it, before I even get started, let me just remind you, though, those of you that are listening in, IsraeliNewsLive.org, maybe it's your first time here, that's our, our website. It's the way you can donate. Of course, our mailing address above my head here is always there for you. But it would be Stephen Benoon at P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Or especially like right now, I'm down in Florida. I'm dealing with my father's affairs. Uh, a lot of a lot of tough things I'm dealing with there. He really had a lot of debts and a lot of issues that I had to deal with or having to deal with. But you can donate online, and believe me, your help is needed and greatly, greatly appreciated. I want to thank you as God leads you in that direction. Um, but again, tonight's message is so, so important, and I can't begin to tell you enough. Let's go right into it. I don't want to waste any more time. I want to first start off here. This is where I left off with you guys just recently from Matthew in the... Hebrew version of the of the book of Matthew. And we're going to be using a lot, a lot of the Hebrew version as well as the regular King James version as well because it's just giving me such depth of understanding uh, that I think is going to be a blessing to you. If you remember, as we spoke about this recently, uh, Matthew chapter 11, I'll back up just a little bit here. Let's go to verse 11. Again, Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, among all those born of women, none has arisen greater than John the baptizer. From his days until now, the kingdom of heaven has been oppressed and senseless persons have been rending it. Uh, for all the prophets in the law spoke concerning John. That's interesting. All the prophets and the law spoke concerning John. If you wish to receive it, Jesus says, he is Elijah who is going to come. Now, if you remember, I shared with you that scripture in the Hebrew. Literally, he says right here, Hu Eliyahu, he is Elijah. Hata, uh, excuse me, Ha'atid, which means the future, Labo, to come. And although in the Greek, Matthew, I've always believed that the same message is being conveyed that it wasn't that John was fulfilling the prophecy of, uh, of Elijah coming as far as 
the chapter three, behold, I prepare uh, my messenger before my face, which Jesus does clearly say that, but he's also another Elijah. Uh, he's Elijah that comes in the future. And that's exactly, see, we have here, he has Elijah who is going to come. And that word going is fine. You could use that there, but it literally is saying he is the Elijah, the future to come. So as we jump, let me just jump over here real quick to Malachi. And I'm going to go back up to the top. All right. Behold, I send my messenger and he shall, he shall clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he cometh, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, if we go back over here again, where we're here in Matthew 11, chapter 11, and you back up, see, Jesus addresses that. Go tell John that which you have seen and that which you have heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are revived, and the poor are acquitted. And by the way, that's how you defeat the works of darkness, by the way. See, Satan brings in his work, which is sickness, disease, famine. But when we cast out devils, when we heal the sick through the name of Jesus Christ, you are destroying the works of darkness. A little tidbit I forgot to share with you there. Um, not many people, I don't really think, really get that part. Uh, it came to pass as they were going, Jesus began to speak to, them, to the crowds about John. He, he said, you went out of the wilderness to see what? A reed cast about by the wind? Or what did you go out to see? Do you think that John was a man clothed with noble garments? Behold, those who wear noble garments are in king's houses. He said, if so, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Truly, I say to you that this one is greater than a prophet. This is he about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will make the way clear before me. Now, Right there, verse 10, Jesus is identifying John's fulfillment of his ministry currently in his own body right then and there as the messenger that prepares the way before me. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Again, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, among all those born of women, none has risen greater than John the baptizer. From his days until now, the kingdom of heaven has been oppressed, and senseless persons have been rending it. For all the prophets and law spoke concerning John. If, now he says, if you wish to receive it. I, excuse me, if you wish to receive it, he is Elijah, the future. Literally, that word should be the future to come. Then he makes that very powerful statement. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So that means only those that truly have a spiritual gift of understanding can get what he's saying. Now that's actually a lot deeper even than what I'm saying here now. I mean, the depth I could take you on that right there, why he actually says, if you wish to receive it, or as the King James Version says, if you can receive it. He is the Elijah that's going to come. That's deep. I'd love to see somebody in the comments that could really grasp the depth of why Jesus says that. All right? It's deep. It's very deep. And by the grace of God, he revealed that to my heart. Um, let's go a little deeper, shall we? Because, like I said, this has blown me away and I think it's really going to be a blessing to many people here this evening. Now we're going into Matthew chapter 17. And I have to find the different places here just so I can remember. All right, this is where we have right here the Mount Transfiguration. That's what the image was that I shared with you at the very beginning of the, of the broadcast just for a visual there. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and uh, th that is Jimmy, and John, his brother, and brought them to a high mountain where he might pray. While he was praying, he was changed before them in his skin as his face shone like the sun and his garments became like white snow. Now, I'm going to pause there because, and, and I want to open up another Matthew. I don't think this is the Matthew that I have. Uh, no, that's Matthew chapter 8. We're going to come to that in a little bit here, though. 
Uh, actually, we'll come right back to Matthew 8 here in a little bit. Let me go ahead and go to Matthew 17. Okay. And behold, there appeared, okay, and it was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now keep that very close to your heart. Why? Why do I say that? Remember Malachi 4? He says here, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, issue and of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings. Right? S-U-N, Son of righteousness, shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now also, this is Malachi chapter 4 in the King James Version, and in the Hebrew Version it's still in chapter 3. For, keep this one in, in close to your heart as well. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Okay? And leaves them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves as a stall. So a stage is being set, and we're seeing a future prophecy. Also, it was a prophecy, Malachi was prophesying about the coming of Christ, but he's going to go even further. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, and for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Two comings. Now, let's back up. And again, we're back in Matthew chapter 17. While he was praying, he was changed before them, and, this, and the skin of his face shone like the sun. Just like in Malachi chapter 4. And his garments became white like snow. Then Moses and Elijah, while speaking with him, were revealed to them, and they told Jesus all which would happen to him in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were asleep. So here Moses and Elijah are prophesying, to Jesus of what's going to happen. They saw his body and the two men with him. And when they went away, then Peter said to Jesus, it is good. Uh, wait a minute, did I miss something here? Okay, no, yeah, let me finish reading in verse 3. Because there are some things here that we don't have in the uh, the, the account of Matthew. Um, where did I go to with that one there? While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well. Please hear ye him. The disciples heard it. They fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them, and, and arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now I think, though, in one of the Gospels, it does speak about, let's see, let us make the air three times, one for Moses, one for Elias. Yeah, they just say, in this one it just says uh, Moses and Elias were talking with him. But I believe there is one version that actually goes kind of like what it does here in the Hebrew Matthew where it says telling him about what was going to befall him. Now, I'll go back to the Hebrew version though. While speaking with him, were revealed to them, and they told Jesus all which would happen to him in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were asleep, asleep but not asleep, awake but not awake. They saw his body and the two men with him. And when they went away, then Peter said to Jesus, It's good for us to be here. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what he was saying. And while he was still speaking, behold, a cloud covered them, and they were greatly alarmed. And while they were under the cloud, they heard from the midst of the cloud a voice speaking and saying, Behold, this is my son, my beloved, my delight is in him. You shall obey him. 
This disciple heard this and fell on their faces to the ground and feared exceedingly. And the voice ceased. Jesus said to them, Arise, do not fear. Now, what's interesting is even though we had Moses and Elijah and Moses was greatly revered as the prophet of God, now the voice that speaks with them is saying to hear my son. He's the one that they are to obey. Wasn't Moses, wasn't Elijah. But what is Moses and Elijah there to begin with? They are there because why? Not only do they are they able to prophesy the things that will befall Jesus, but they also are there because, you know, there's one thing that keeps coming to my mind real quick. Let me, let me stop for just a second. And it might be that somebody listening is, is something that they may go through when they hear this message there because I'm reading from the Hebrew Matthew. And so I want to take you down to, um, let's see. Let's go to Luke here. Okay. And paid fashion of his countenance and altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. All right, that's what I wanted to share with you there, because I, I've just felt in my heart that somebody, you, you know, you're reading it from the Hebrew and you're like, well, you're just adding to what Matthew said. Uh, you know, we don't have that recorded. It is recorded. It's recorded in the book of Luke. When Luke gave that gospel there, they spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So when you're looking over here in the Hebrew Matthew, and he goes in there, uh, and to them, they told Jesus all which would happen to him in Jerusalem it does line up with the scripture. It's like you're getting both what Matthew wrote in the Greek and then what the Luke is in the Greek, and we're getting them combined together into one place in the Hebrew Matthew. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. I just felt like for some reason that's going to be a little bit of a stumbling block, so I want to get that out of the way. So they saw his body in the two men. Now, again, what is that, though? Mo See, Moses and Elijah, not only are they able to prophesy, as Luke says, his own decease, in other words, his crucifixion, they're prophesying to him about it. So they are there. They are able to appear there. Somehow or another, they're able to appear. They're not dead. They're both alive. And so they're able to appear. And they see and witness his death, burial, and resurrection. And this is the reason why you see in the two witnesses in Revelation 11, when their dead bodies will lay in the street for three days and three nights, and then the life comes back in their body again, and they rise up to their feet. It is because, and I've taught this for many, many, many years, that it is a witness. That's why they're called witnesses in Revelation, because they were a witness of the true resurrection. And now they're going to live out the death, burial, and resurrection that the entire world will see. And there will be no more excuse that Jesus Christ truly rose from the dead, because now they're going to see the two witnesses rise from the dead in the streets of Jerusalem, right there near that Palestinian bus stop there uh, where Golgotha is. That's what it even says in the scriptures there. We know that from Revelation 11, right? And that, that's what we have. I'll give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. By the way, don't stop the video either. I haven't got to those powerful passages that apply to them that we have never caught before. So I'm just wanting to encourage you, stay with me here. It's fixing to get really, really interesting. A lot of this is just kind of re rehearsing things that we already know, but don't, don't, don't leave me here. Let's stay with it. Uh, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed, Re right? But then what happens? When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Going to go a little longer than what Jesus was there and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. 
And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they have a great voice from heaven saying, excuse me, they heard a great voice from heaven saying uh, unto them, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. They are the proof that the death, burial, and resurrection is a true in fact, bonafide statement in the world will never, that, that brings judgment upon the earth, by the way. And in fact, everything from that point afterwards is judgment. Judgment, right? Now, we're going to find out more about that as we go on here. Let me get back over here where we were. Uh, we got that. We already did the, uh, the Matthew 17 now, uh, going on the Mount Transfiguration. And again, like I said too, Mount Transfiguration, his face shone like the sun, then we see that also in Malachi uh, chapter 4, or in this case, chapter 3 in the Hebrew version. For behold, the day comes, burns the oven, a furnace, of proud, and all that do work wickedness shall be stubble. The day that comes shall set them ablaze, saith the Lord of hosts, it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, right there, of righteousness arise with healing in uh, its, but his wings. All right, and here we have it right there, the Shemesh, the Son. Uh, the son of righteousness, uh, you know, he will raise up with the Bikana, in his wings, the healing, uh, Rafa, Rafa is the healer, uh, in his wings. And you shall go forth and gamble as calves of the stall and you shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do make, do make, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant which I commanded unto him and Horeb for all Israel, even the statutes and the ordinances. That's another thing. Another reason why Moses has to come, because Moses has to testify that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. There was no need, as Paul spoke about that, you know, and many of the other apostles as well, and Jesus himself said, to sum it up, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two sum up the entire summation. Moses has to come back and witness that to the people. All right? But he says, Behold, I will send you, Elijah, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And as I did that message just recently with you, that's what Jesus was saying here. If you wish to receive it, he is the Elijah who is in the future to come. That future to come, Elijah, in your King James, is Malachi 4 right there. Behold the coming of the great and dead. Behold, I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, right? Now, we have that. That's great. Steve, you've said this all the time for a long time. We got it. What's so new? What's so special, though? All right? What's so special? Now, Go back to eight. Okay. The only reason I had Matthew chapter eight up is to show where Jesus says, after he cleansed the one person, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go your way and show yourself unto the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. All right. Uh, I, I need to go back and teach that on a separate time on that. But let's move forward. Now we are in Matthew. Um, and I need to look real quick. Matthew 24, verse 41. In the Hebrew Matthew here, though, we have more in the Hebrew Matthew than you have in the King James Version. In the King James Version, it says the first part, two women will be grinding at a mill. One will be taken, the other left. And that's where it ends. But in this particular, the Hebrew Version, it goes on and says, this is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks from the world and will separate the good from the evil. When I read that, it wasn't the fact that I don't have that in the Hebrew, excuse me, in the King James Version of Matthew, because what caught my eye, and the reason why I wasn't worried about it, it was because I knew that there was a scripture 
in Matthew as well that applies to that under the tares. Where it speaks of the angels coming to separate the, the wheat from the, from the chaff. So it was, no, it was no great bother for me to read that. And I'm going to take you to where we're at here. So you can, we're going to look at this together. So let's go down to Matthew 24. We're going to drop the first 41. See, two women should be grinding at the mill. The one should be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known and what watched the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. The Hebrew Matthew, again, says this is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling block, blocks, sorry, from the world and will separate the good from the evil. Now the word there can be translated as stumbling blocks. Or like the obstacle. There's something that's hindering us. That's got to be removed. Is it the law? Like I said, Moses has to come as a witness to testify that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. I think the ministries of both Moses and Elijah are critical. In helping to open the eyes of the people. See, because two women will be grinding at a mill, one will be taken, the other is going to be left. And as he said, this is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks from the world and will separate good from the evil, light from darkness. Now, angels throws a lot of people off though. And you're going to get into the part of Matthew to where it uses the same word again, but yet this time you're going to get what the whole point of this is all about. But right here, wait, where, where, do you, where do we have it here? Alam, okay. Um, okay. Vezei yahi she hamelachim. The word angel is messenger. It doesn't necessarily mean somebody that comes down wings on. It's just the word messenger. So Moses and Elijah are angels or messengers in their own right at their own times that they were given. If you remember in Obadiah, we read, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the Lord's kingdom shall be the Lord's. Moshaim, anointed ones but can be translated as saviors, but it means anointed ones. And this, of course, as we know, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. They shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape and shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Remember I told you guys about the vision I had years and years ago where I was in Jerusalem, outside of the, uh, Zion's gate, and it had totally changed. Didn't even there was hardly no grass there, nothing. And I was used to always being grass along that hillside there, but it all been changed. Later I go there, and years, you know, a couple of years after the vision, and sure enough, everything I'd seen in the vision was like that. The grass was grown. They put a sidewalk in, some trees in, some benches in, and there was that rocky area, just like what I'd seen. In fact, there was even a rock there, and I did a video on this, very similar to what I'd seen in the vision where like in an amber light in the Hebrew language comes on there, there's a man drinking upon my mountain and then it goes away and then appeared again and you are to remove him. He never revealed to me what it meant. The odd thing was though, the Pope of Rome had come there to Mount Zion to do a communion service in the upper room. Now, I didn't have a problem really so much with that, but 
But I did have a problem when the Catholic Church the following week went down to the tomb of David and did the exact same thing, showing that they had the hegemony over the entire Mount Zion, which made the, the Jewish people so angry and they protested like crazy over this. Was that what the Lord was saying? I don't know. I don't know. But the point that I wanted to share with you, though, the saviors, or in this case, Mosheim, the anointed ones, shall come up on the, on the Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Let's hold it. Now we're going to get into it. And then, as of course, as I read in the Hebrew Matthew over here, where it says this is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks from the world and will separate the good from the evil, I could not help but realize in the book of Matthew, in the, let me figure out which chapter that's in. Matthew 13, chapter 13, I believe. I hope I got that right. where we get the tares, etc. This is when I begin to realize it's one and the same. Watch what we read here. I'm going to back up a little bit. Jesus is giving the tares of, of, of all the seed and the sower, right? The sower is the son of man. And the seed which fell on the road is everyone who hears the kingdom of heaven and does not understand it. Satan comes and snatches it from his heart, everything which was sown in it. And this is the seed which fell on the road. Let me read that again because I think I may have read something wrong here. The sower is the son of man and the seed which fell on the road is everyone that hears the kingdom of heaven and does not understand it. Satan comes and snatches away from his heart everything which was sown in it. This is the seed which fell on the road. That which fell upon the rocks is the one who hears the word of God and receives it immediately with joy. But he is without root and is a confusion when a little trouble and distress comes to them, Satan causes them to forget from their heart. That which fell among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word and his desire to gather wealth. Satan causes him to forget the word and God and he, and he makes no fruit. That which fell into the good earth is the one who hears the word and understands it and makes fruit. That is from good works. He brings forth from the first, a hundred, from the second, sixty, from the third, thirty, from the, uh, the four, the hundred, and as one purified of heart, sanctified the body. As for the sixty, this is the one separated from women. As for the thirty, this is the one sanctified in the matrimony, in the body, and in heart. He said before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows good seed in his field. It's really where I should have started. It was right here. And it came to pass when the men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares over the wheat that is Berega, and he went away. And it came to pass when the herb grew up to make fruit, he saw the tares. And the servants of the master of the field drew near to him and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed? Then whence came the tares? And he said to them, My enemy did this. His servant said to him, We will uproot the tares. He said to them, No, lest you uproot the wheat. Now, by the way, if you go and listen to that message I did over on Patreon, when I get into uh, especially the book of Jude, proving that the fallen angels crept in again, and they did what? They sowed their seed upon, literally it's upon, that wheat. They were mingling the seed once again. He said, let them grow together to the harvest. And the time of the harvest, here we go. I will say to the reapers, 
gather the tares first and bind them into individual burn, bundles for burning and the wheat put into the granary. He set before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard which a man takes and sows in the field. And it is smaller than all the garden herbs, but when it grows up, it is greater than all the herbs and is made into a great tree to the birds of heaven withdraw into its branches. He spoke to them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened to the leaven, which a woman puts into three measures of flour. It leavens in all, all of it. All of these parables Jesus spoke to the crowds. Without a parable, he did not speak to them. To fulfill that which was said according to the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter riddles from ancient times. Then Jesus was departed from the crowds and went into the house. His disciples came to him and asked him to explain, to explain for them a parable of the tares. They got the rest. They want to know about the tares. He answered and said to them, The one who sows good seed is man. The field is the world. The good fruit is the righteous. And the tares are the evil. The enemy has sowed it is Satan, and the, excuse me, the standing grain at the end is the world to come, and the reapers are the angels. As the reapers gather the tares to burn, so will it be at the end of the days. The Son of Man will send his angels to uproot from his kingdom all the evil and all who do iniquity. They will cast them into the pyre of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the what? The S-U-N, the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. There is your Malachi prophecy right there. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him and to Horeb for all Israel, even the statutes and the ordinances. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with an utter destruction. Now Jesus does give credit to John turning the heart of the fathers to the children. But he never finished the other half, the heart of the children to their fathers. And the heart of the fathers to the children was their desire, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, to set things straight. He turned their, the heart of the fathers to the children. But then at the end, right before the destruction, the heart of the children has to be turned back to the father. We're not talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Other than their desire of the Messiah. And that's, the earth is going to be smitten with a destruction. And what did we find here? And, and, uh, and, and maybe I should go right into King James to make this a little bit simpler for everyone here. Well, we're in Matthew 13, right? So let's, let's quickly... I believe that's where we're at, Matthew 13. I hope I got that right. Yes, here we go. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And remember that one interesting one in Hebrew here. Let's see where I have it here. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. The other one left. This is because the angels at the end, at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks from the world and will separate good from the evil. So see, that's not even an addition either because we already have it written right here in Matthew chapter 13. The field is the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. See, those fallen angels keep intermingling and bringing in corrupt seed. 
the enemy that sowed them as the devil, the harvest, the end of the world, and the reapers of the angels. As, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteousness shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Because why? They're just like Jesus. He that has an ear, let him hear. Just like Jesus said over there with John, he said, if you can receive it, he is Elijah who's going to come. He is the angel. He is the messenger. He is one of the two witnesses. It all ties together. And in that one new one that we saw in the Hebrew, Matthew, we find out they're going to remove the stumbling blocks from the world. They're going to reveal to you about these fallen ones. They're going to open up your heart to what the truth is. Then when you begin to look at uh, Revelation 11, then it begins to make more sense about their ministry. Makes more sense. God gives power to them. They prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Remember that over, what is it, Zechariah? The two olive branches on either side of the golden lance stand. And, and he asked, Zechariah asked, what be these, Lord? He said, I don't even know. What are they? He said, these are what? The two anointed ones. Right? Let's, let's just let's pull that up. Uh, so, we don't, so we don't lose it while we're at it. And then we'll close. Olive branches, I believe is how it's worded over there in Zechariah. And yes, Zechariah 4. I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which uh, through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? He answered me and said, Know you not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. There you go. The sun. Uh, gets higher. I'd have to look at that in the Hebrew over there. I was just looking quickly to see what it has on there. The two anointed ones. These are those angels. And that's what blew me away is that we're reading right there in Matthew the entire time when he's talking about he sends forth his angels and those angels, I am persuaded, are the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, that come in the end. I know some people believe Enoch and Elijah, but I've gone through that many times before when people use the scripture on there. It's appointed to once for man to die and after this to judgment. Clearly, as plain as day, read the chapter. It applies only to Jesus Christ. I mean... You got too many people that have to come back and die again. There's been a lot of people raised from the dead. What do they got to go back and die again? What about those that don't taste death? Change in the moment, and twinkling of an eye. They got to come back and die again sometime too. See, you have to make the scripture work right with it. I trust this truly is a blessing, and I want to thank you again. Thank you for the support of this ministry. We can't do this without you, and we want to thank you for your kindness in advance that God lays out upon your heart to help us. We do need your help. And donating online right now is probably the best way. I've been already two weeks away from home. Uh, had a wonderful miracle happen for us as well. I accidentally locked one of the cats in my office there. Been there for almost two weeks and as if nothing happened to her at all. Perfectly in great health, no problems. Survived just fine. And we really thank the Lord for that as well. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live.